Welcome to the Combative Nerds Podcast. Join us while we break balls and try to outwit each other at every turn while debating all things nerdum and trying to make sense of this world. Look, I'm not going to lie. There's a Herculean task. I'm not sure we have enough brain powder to do so. At the very least, we can laugh and offend each other through the process. Thanks for sharing your day with us. Now on to our show. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Thank you for joining us for our next installment. I know you... I'm sorry. It's been so long, I forgot the introductions. This is Raider Lance and... Fighter Wizard. Sorry, I of course I did that right when it was drinking water. It's been a while since Fighter Wizard and I have gotten together and recorded. What we initially did is we did the pilot episodes that hopefully you listen to, episodes one through three, and then... We had to work on developing the podcast. First, we had to you know check our chemistry, learn the tech, and all that. Then we had to work on our socials, figure out you know podcast hosts and all that good stuff. So there's been a, almost about a two month. So we're going to get reacquainted a little bit, and the best way to do that is catch up on the past, flip each other in the middle finger. Okay, so at the end of episode three, the B side, I said we were going to discuss Roe v. Way. And we were going to discuss COVID. We actually did record the Roe v. Way podcast. It was kind of depressing. It was a complete legal analysis, which, you know, Fighter Wizard claims that I'm an asshole. But I actually verified that I am by divulging that I am a California licensed attorney. So I'm pretty sure it says that in the small print on the license. But I'm sure that it does as well. But it was a very informative podcast at least for me since i'm one of the few people that will hear it and i have since per- and i have since perpetuated your information to uh at least a few people uh to whom i've spoken regarding that oh interesting well i, I take that as high praise maybe we'll we'll have it as a lost one or maybe once we get enough of a following or something we'll figure out and publish it again it was a pretty heavy full legal analysis i think it was like an hour i try to make it a little bit lighter but we'll hold on to that yeah i know if you can make that subject light I tried yeah. and abortion, failed. the greatest <laughs> party conversation ever. Always what? open with an abortion joke. It makes it lively, no matter what. Fair. I guess lively really is the wrong terminology when speaking about abortion. Anyways, let's go. Let's get on to the subject. Yet. <laughs> so you know there are so many. It's just, you know what I'm gonna just. They're all queued up, and I'm gonna. Let's, okay, okay. No. You've been working on them too. All right. So. I wanted to talk to you about something to lead into our COVID conversation, but it was kind of two months ago. So I know this is old news, but I'm going to bring it up. Have you heard of the term sundowning? Yeah, in relation to an Alzheimer's patient? Exactly. And so I've never heard of it before. I mean, I've I've always seen the jokes. I've actually grew up with quite a few old people near old age homes visiting my grandparents. But I've never heard the term sundowning. So just for the audience, if you don't know. That's generally when someone has Alzheimer's, dementia, cognitive decline because they're elderly or they have, you know, one of those various diseases. And the term comes from the sun rising and the sun setting. And it seems to be that one of the theories is that when elderly people with these cognitive issues wake up in the morning, they tend to probably be a little bit more spry, a little bit more lucid. They can formulate sentences where they are. But as the sun starts setting, meaning the day gets longer or the longer they've been awake, they'll start to lose this cognitive decline. And it got brought up in the news because of Joe Biden falling off the bike and then a couple of his other speeches after. So some people were saying, you know, it seems like a classic sense of sundowning. And interestingly enough, Fighter 2 Wizard Downing is what the listener, (laughs) you're ruining it, is what the listener will see if you go watch him train on the weekends, his takedown defense. So my question to you is, do you, have have you ever stuffed... Have you ever stuff to take down or do you just lay on your back and open your guard? Is that your, de- is that your takedown defense? Are you asking me if I lay on my back and open my legs? <laughs> Not the first time you've been asked that. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. No, my spider guard is, is insane. So it's more like they're up in stirrups. No, I knew when you like launched into the sundowning, the longer it went, I'm like this, this is a setup. This is a setup to an insult. And, you know, Elaborate uh, my- one. My takedown defense is not that good. I will be the first to admit. So, so can we say your takedown defense is equivalent to Biden's cognition or better or worse? I am as good at takedown defense as he is at riding a bike. 
<laughs> Although today I was specifically practicing take that. Well, see, most people in my gym are guard pullers. They don't they don't have like an aggressive. Yeah. At that point, why don't you just? Are you starting on your knees, or are you guys starting standing? I'll usually try to start standing unless it's really crowded. So why? Today why we not just starting start, a lot. Why not just start on your knees if you're going to just be pulling guard right away? Well, so like a guard entry I'm working working on right now is kind of going into De La Hiva. And I was working with this guy who's very good at De La Hiva. He actually just took silver at Worlds. Oh, wow. And Blue Belt Masters. Yeah, he's good. M- Mundells um, or which I think they're a different type of one. Isn't the Mundells also the Worlds? Like they're different organizations for the Worlds? It's, okay, the, it's IBJJF in Las Vegas. I don't know enough IBJJ, about the Okay, no, no, no. IB, so you, it's IBJJF yeah, Worlds. Okay. Um, he took silver and masters in, in blue belt division. He's 40. Good he's for him. Me. Yeah, he's he's a beast. He's a former, like he was almost an Olympian Taekwondo guy. So he like he eats, sleeps, yeah. and breathes competition. Yeah. Has a PhD in like computer engineering or something like that. That's so awesome. Yeah. Not only can he kick your ass, he can talk down to you. <laughs> Make you feel stupid. <laughs> yeah. 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 Got it. And he has that same analytical approach to his jujitsu. Anyway, I've been working on an entry into De La Hiva that he likes, which is from a snap down, you step outside of their channel really low. So you step out and, you and snap? Step. Yeah. Well, so you, you snap, you get them down, and then you step. You don't have to snap, but anyway, you step out really far outside their channel. So this mic is the, you step out really far. Sure. Um, off to the side and then roll and insert your leg for the, for the De La Hiva. And specifically for that, I, I find that really helpful because you get that whole roll and momentum and you're, you know, you're, you have a, sure. several, at least two grips. So in answer to your question, I'll stand, especially to practice that. I always need help in my takedown defense and I'll be the first to admit that my takedowns are pretty shitty. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, oh my God, I forgot that instructor's name. Well, we probably shouldn't say it, but over at Karab, one of the instructors was a high school wrestler and he was too small to be call it collegiate, or I should say not thin enough to be collegiate. He was more in the, the, the HQ teaching. Oh, I know, I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And so we were, I forgot what we were doing. He wasn't teaching wrestling takedowns, you know, just, but he did the whole drop your knee forward and then shoot. Mm-hmm. And he went, okay, you try. And like my leg couldn't do it. Like I didn't have <laughs> the neural pathways for my brain was like, okay, just drop your knee and push forward on your back leg. Like I didn't have those pathways at all. And then I, hard. And then I, it's just, I don't want to say it's not natural. Of course it's natural, but it is, it, it, it's learned. It's like throwing a proper hook, right? It's sure. You just gotta, you have to figure it out the proper technique, and then you got to just drill it. Anyways. Wait. I thought we were going to say his name. but younger kid. like on, <laughs> So he's taller than me, dark hair, young. He I don't. A, he, was, he was a wrestler. I, I think so. Big time. I, I think so. Okay, I don't, yeah, don't remember really, the dark. A, I, think, I think he's an engineer now. Was he Jesus white? Christ. Oh, well, yeah. It, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I know yeah, exactly yeah. who you're talking about. I, know, um, another, I really like him. He taught me some stuff, too. Like his, he's a beast. I think he's brown belt now. Oh my God, I could totally see that. You yeah. could just tell it, you know, the stuff just clicked for him. Uh, he put a lot of work into it, but yeah, he, he had one of those brains that just kind of, well, he's a smart guy and his brain works the right way. He had a base too. I mean, we didn't get into training into our mid to late twenties. He, if he was high school wrestler, and I bet yeah. you he probably wrestled before that. I mean, you start building that foundation early. No, him, he man. was he was one of the, like the real high school wrestlers who knows what cutting weight is like, and it's actually talking to yeah. my father. He was a big time high school wrestler in the sixties. Mm-hmm. So his version of cutting weight is, I think he wrestled at like one seventeen. Oh my god! My father's my size. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I so uh, anyway. yeah, Res- wrestlers just have my ultimate respect. Them and fighters, not because different of- breed. You know what? I don't think people respect cutting weight. I've never done it. I've had friends who've done it. And it's like an interview I saw with Jose Aldo once. He was, or Jose Aldo. He basically said no, no, the first. Jose. Is it Jose? Yep. Okay. The first fight is with the, the scale. And then the second one is with the opponent. And the first one's harder. And I was just like, Jesus Christ. And this was when he was at the top of the game. 
Yeah. So yeah, no, I wouldn't. Um, I think John cut twenty pounds once. I would never. I had to oh. lose seven pounds like slowly for a competition, good but for I did your that kidneys. over a week. I didn't cut. Yeah, uh, my my father swears to this day that like I would be taller if I hadn't done that yeah. to my body. That's not the first time I've heard that about wrestlers. You, I mean, it would make sense that malnutrition stunts your growth. Sure. I mean, look at I. It, didn't they attribute that to Koreans and the larger Koreans that moved outside of North Korea? Not Koreans in general, but they're you know Koreans were malnourished in North Korea. Then immediately, once they went south, their children with a different diet were significantly larger than them. So I would assume. I would be unsurprised if that were the case, but I know nothing about it. Yeah. All right. So I'm not sure how we got there. Oh, you not having takedown defense. Anyway, so the uh, real reason we got that we were again here is COVID. So a little bit of the back story. I am not an anti-vaxxer, but I understand. And so I was very leery of getting the COVID vaccine way back when, you know, two years ago when it was an actual thing to be scared of. So I talked to Fighter 2 Wizard, who has the academic credentials to, I'm not an expert, but he's well more than qualified to discuss this topic. So I called him and he broke down the science for me and I didn't want to anyways, but he used a couple big words, one that I had to look up. Fuck you for that. Deleterious. And that that, that look up, that look up, yeah, that's only happened to me twice in my life where someone hit me with the word and I went, shit, I'm gonna have to look that up later. Just nod and act like you know what they meant. (laughs) The first one was elucidate fucker. Anyways, so he didn't talk me into it. My mom asked me to get it, talked me into it, but I was comforted by, you know, his words. And then I was supposed to call him back and ask about the kids getting vaccinated and whether that's bullshit and if it's going to give them problems down the road. So I wanted to talk to Fighter 2 Wizard months ago about the conversation of COVID vaccines and whether it's worth getting your kids vaccinated. I know things have changed. The CDC has backtracked, recanted, said mea culpa, mask, no mask, whatever. You're good. Sorry we got all you people fired. And... Now, where are we at with COVID? How afraid should we be? Should we get the eighth booster? Do uh, Oh, my wife wanted me to specifically ask you, is the first shot enough? Do they really need to get the second? Doesn't seem that bad. So that's your question. If you can answer that somewhere during the explanation of COVID to us people who don't understand. That's a lot. That's what she said. (laughs) <laughs> Probably, I don't think she said that to you. <laughs> Asshole. <laughs> that's what I get. Let's see. Yeah, that's, that is a lot. Forgive the ums. So I guess I'll start with, you're right. I am not an expert. So my academic bona fides are such as they are, and they are somewhat thin for my position is I currently work at a pharmaceutical company. And my educational background is I have a PhD in molecular biology, specifically focusing on retroviral pathogenesis. I studied AIDS, or at least HIV. I studied the way that the virus evolves in response to the administration of antiviral drugs, specifically focused on one single protein. And I say that, that A, my background is not necessarily in coronavirus, and B, probably setting myself up for a huge fall when I start misspeaking. And if anybody ever listens to this and then starts commenting like he doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about, I might be forced to agree with him depending on what they say. Alton, this is not medical advice. This is not medical advice at all. What this is, is I'm an idiot and I can barely read the footnotes in some of these case studies. So I'm having my buddy have a buddy conversation with me to try to dumb it down for me. All right. That is, yeah, that is, I am, I am in no way a medical professional and I am not suited to give medical advice at all. And I'm here for legal disclaimer stuff, right? So thank you. I appreciate that. And if, you, yeah, exactly. And I'll just say, talk to my lawyer and you just be, I'll get, I'll send you a dollar. So you become my lawyer now. Let's see. So I suppose when you originally called me with questions on the vaccine, the question about the vaccine was whether it would be effective, uh, how it worked or what it did. True. 
and this is a bit outdated now because the vaccine has become fairly benign, fairly commonplace, benign, like the concept of it. Yeah. Nice. Nice. The concept of it has become more palatable for the, the general public. Uh, at first, you know, there was there, this, this sideways gl- look at it like, well, they did it so fast. Oh my gosh. Right. How right. long did it take to develop a polio vaccine? And these guys did it in six months. Yep. And that question, the technology behind it, since it's not, since at least the vaccine most people got, including myself, Moderna is not the, I won't say tried and true, but I'll say traditional technology for producing a vaccine. Yep. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of vaccine hesitancy. It's even a, it's a, it's yeah, a word, it's I, phrase now. I think one of the questions I asked, would it change my DNA because of the way this new process that they did? I had all those conspiracy theories running through my head. Sure. So no, and, but not, not no. <laughs> so, <laughs> Isn't that everything with science? <laughs> You will never, I, in, in my experience, you will never find a researcher that will say, a, will say absolute yes or absolute no. They'll always qualify it because the goal sure. is to find out, you know, if you're wrong or it's, you know, usually you see these studies and they're so easily misinterpreted because they're for a very specific set of circumstances. But anyway, that said. So the way the Moderna vox- vaccine works is it is an mRNA vaccine. It is delivered to your body, and the mRNA is uptaken by your immune system, specifically an antigen-presenting cell. And what that does is it primes your the – there's lots of them, but two primary types of cells responsible for mediating an immune response. They're called CD8 cells and CD4 cells. CD just refers to one of the receptors that the cell exhibits. Your cell is covered in all sorts of receptors that enable the cell to talk to other cells in our body. And one of the ways they talk is they present uh, proteins of themselves to the immune system that either say, I've been infected. Well, they can say a lot of things, but one of the things they say is, I've been infected. You should kill me. I've been infected. Here's what that looks like. So you can go find other infected cells and kill them. Or... I'm not infected. This is what I look like. Don't kill me and don't kill anything that has this. So by introducing foreign mRNA, in this case for the spike protein, should I explain what mRNA and protein is? Uh, If you want. We'll just assume. Okay. At least everybody's heard of it by now. Sure. So when that mRNA is uptaken by the antigen presenting cell, it can be made into an epitope. An epitope is just a small block of, of amino acids or protein or chopped up. And that epitope is presented on the cell, antigen presenting cell, and it either primes a CD8 cell, which is also called a killer T cell. And when the killer T cell binds to the new protein, the new uh, coronavirus protein, it says, ah, great. I am going to search out and destroy anything that expresses this protein. Any cell that exhibits this signal, I will kill it. And I will recruit other cells to it that kill that cell and then search and destroy any other cell that likes that. So it's a, you know, a smart, a smart bomb. Sure. And the other thing it presents to a CD4 cells, which is, it essentially says, go find other immune cells, show them this protein, this spike protein from coronavirus, and make a lot more of them so that they can go search and destroy. So it's not only a one, two punch, but it's a very complimentary. It's it's a complimentary thing. And there's lots of feedback loops and positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, all sorts of stuff. It's it's fascinating. And I'm not an immunologist, so I barely understand it, which is probably evident if you are an immunologist and you just listen to what I said. So all of that said, that is how the Moderna vaccine works. It is an mRNA vaccine. You introduce that foreign mRNA to your body. Your body uses it to produce a protein. And there's all sorts of different sequences of that mRNA because the spike protein might change. And if you think of the way cells interact, you could think of as based on shape. If something has just the right shape and the other part has just the right receptor, the lock and key, then they can fit together. The coronavirus is not smart in any way. The reason it infects lung cells is or I should say uh, lung epithelial cells, but also gut epithelial cells, is it has just the right shape to when it bumps into a lung cell, its spike protein fits. The reason HIV 
the reason HIV infects your um, CD4 positive T cells is it just happens to have a receptor that fits CD4 positive T cells really well. So it fits. There's other like more evolved mechanisms that, that introduce those cells into the or sorry, introduce those viruses into the cells or by which the virus gains entry. That's kind of the, the really basic gist of it. So that is a relatively, that's a very new technology. It's been researched for, you know, 20, 25 years, but introduced into the mat, to the public, especially with a, a mass vaccine movement or effort was definitely new. So people had a lot of hesitancy about it and you had that same sort of hesitancy now that the vaccine has been introduced into the public at large and the effects have been seen, yeah, so there's multiple vaccines. Now there's multiple boosters for those vaccines. Um, most people are okay with it and they're okay getting the vaccines. Now you can argue like all sorts of conspiracy theories and whatnot, but at the end of the day, they are effective. They are demonstrably effective. There are reams of, uh, scient- of data that support their efficacy. They are more effective than post post exposure medications. And uh, let me interrupt you there. They are more effective than being post exposure and or medications, like well, one or the other, or vac- both. Sorry. So, getting the vaccine preventing you from getting the illness is more effective than you taking ivermectin after you get the illness. Okay. Um, or hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine is you should not take it. It's no. Really? Well, no. obviously I've heard otherwise. It is a it is a medication for it can be administered to a COVID patient. It is a medication for other uh, conditions. Um, but the initial study that you know sort of caused hydroxychloroquine to explode onto the stage was a flawed study at best. It came out of um, a French hospital. Um, I read it at the time and. I'm not the best at reading scientific literature, especially that's out of my field. But even when I read it, I was like, I don't know how he got some of these numbers. But of course, I, I usually cleave towards, I'm a, I'm a bad researcher in this case, because I don't arrive with a healthy sense of doubt. I always arrive. I'm pretty optimistic. So I'm like, good job. You found something new. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway. Interesting. So I, I, I'm, I'm rambling. So I, I guess I don't know like a, a more pointed direction to take this. Well, let, let me ask you, okay, so one of the arguments, I've had a gentleman in my office said, I had the COVID, why do I now need a vaccine? That's a common question. The reason that you, not you, the reason that I will still take the vaccine, and I have also recently had COVID, is because viruses, all life, to quote Dr. Ian Malcolm, life finds a way, hmm. life evolves, viruses evolve rather quickly. So if you think of, you know what, I don't need the analogy, HIV. HIV is a slowly replicating virus. It's called a lenti virus. Lenti means slow. Its replication cycle is slow compared to something like a uh, smallpox or a bacteriophage, which is a virus that infects bacteria. There's a lot of them. Every li- living organism on the planet has a specific set of viruses that infect it. Hmm. Cool, huh? Anyway, no, um, not at all. But it's interesting. So that's why I really like it. Because that, anyway, never mind. Yeah, I know. Um, We're not going to see an eye on that one, but sure. So when HIV replicates inside your cells, it has it copies itself. It copies its own genome and then inserts that genome into your genome. And then your machinery copies that genome and turns it into a virus. Hmm. Proteins. But anyway, but when it copies itself, it doesn't do a perfect job. Yep. So it always makes mistakes, mm-hmm. just like ours we have a much more evolved mechanism of surviving our mistakes or actually improving upon them and culling what is not, doesn't work. But when HIV does it, um, I like that statistically the rate of error that it's polymerase makes and the length of its genome result in every single progeny virus from the original infecting virus is genetically distinct, even if only once by one nucleotide from the progeny. So a lot of those do, those never make it out the out the door. It's a it's a lethal mutation for the virus. It's not able to perform you know a protein. It's not able to replicate. Oh, wow. Sometimes though it is. Okay. And if it's different, and if it causes a difference in the protein shape, such that whatever drug you're taking no longer binds or doesn't bind as well, well then your drug doesn't work as well either. Sure. And this is no different. So your. CD8 pot, your immune system is primed to recognize 
my hand with all four the like my hand sitting straight up with all four fingers together and my thumb like immediately adjacent to my palm after a few mutations the this is the spike protein let's say on the coronavirus after a few mutations it might look like this where my sure. hand my fingers are now bent slightly now if your cells can only recognize this sure then this looks nothing like that and they're unable to bind and therefore kill the cell they might recognize a little bit and that's one possibility. There is also a low fidelity polymerase with uh, coronavirus that causes not that same error rate. It's it's higher fidelity than that, but there is a you know a, a basal error rate in the coronavirus's replication cycle, or at least replication of its own genome. So, the progeny that the original virus, the infecting virus, produces within that cell can and will be genetically distinct from the, the original virus. I'm not going to use terms like mother virus or anything because it's inappropriate. And because they are genetically distinct, that population will evolve within your body. And if it evolves sufficiently and you infect and I infect you, then you will now have an evolved virus. And this is exactly what happens for any infectious agent, whether it happens quickly or slowly or, or whatnot, um, or effectively is, is, a, is a question of a lot of things. But this is exactly what happens with life, with viruses. And you can see it with, with huge trees of, of clades, essentially, of just different types and subtypes and variants of the coronavirus. So very long-winded answer to say the type of virus that your coworker was infected with, or which, with which your coworker was infected, may not be the type of virus that his body experiences upon the next, upon maybe not the next exposure. That would be below probability of happening because most likely the population that he's in is is experiencing the same variant that he would. Mm. But in a year from now, the virus that he is introduced to at that point might be gene sufficiently genetically distinct to where his cells are no longer able to mount a sufficient immune response to it, and he might become infected again. And you see it happen. You see these people get infected like three times. So let me wrap this up in a way that I can understand with an, an analogy. Different viruses, let's just say, mutate successfully at different rates. So like, for example, smallpox is smallpox, and we have the same vaccine over the decades, because that has mutated slower at a successful rate, if at all. Smallpox does not exist in the natural world. It has been eradicated. So the reason we have those, the, so the reason how about polio are static or measles or chicken polio pox. Is a, sure. Yeah. Th those so, are, yeah. Better example. Okay. Better example. Thank you. So those things basically have not evolved. They're the great, <laughs> they're like great white sharks, broad brushes here. Yeah, broad brushes that they haven't really evolved enough so we can use the same vaccine. That's the point. No? Too far off? Ah, oh, goddamn. Here's the problem talking to scientists. Yeah, I'm sorry. So the reason <laughs> that... <laughs> Fuck. So I would say that the reason you do not experience that same... So those, those vaccines are updated and those vaccines are, are addressed. But the push, I guess, to have, let's say, a chickenpox vaccine is that your body will enjoy near lifelong immunity from it until you're about 65 or, or 70, in which point it can have viral recrudescence and you'll get something like shingles, right? which right. sucks. But so those viruses are, so I should say, those vaccines are addressed and updated and intelligently designed. You feel from the okay. Phrase. Okay. So they're still uh, updated. Okay. But it's just that more, it's just that much more prevalent in the public consciousness because for all intents and purposes, well, measles has a really high infectivity rate. It's a childhood vaccine, so no one sees it. Almost no one gets it anymore. So you don't have to worry about it. Your kid's not going to transmit measles to you because you're immunized against measles. So, but kids, if they weren't immunized so early, they could transmit it to themselves and us. You mean like in Northern California? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or a, <laughs> a, a subset of a population in Minnesota. But... It's just that much more in the public consciousness because we can see in real time the virus evolve and the virus evade the prophylactic efforts we design for it. Now, if everybody was swapping measles all the time, you could probably see the same thing with measles. If everybody was swapping plague back and forth, we would see the same thing with plague. 
if everybody swaps HIV, it's slower, but you can see populations of HIV. There are five major subgroups of HIV. They tend to, they, they're named because they occur in different regions of the world, but there are subtypes from that. But the, the population of HIV changes over time because people swap it. That's how the virus pr- propagates. Interesting. Okay, so let me say what I thought, which is you've I'm just sorry, cleared I to- up. I totally interrupted. I'm sorry. No, no, no. So what I thought was that viruses, let's say a coronavirus is a fast mutating virus, whereas some, you know, measles would be a slow mutating. But it sounds like what you're saying is maybe there's some difference in how fast they can evolve. However, we are more concerned with catching and shutting down measles and those type, whereas with coronavirus has enough exposure, gets spread so easily, we can't catch it and shut it down so that it has more time to evolve. Not necessarily. Here's here's my understanding. From a flu shot, which is a coronavirus, right? No, it's an influenza virus. Oh, okay. Interesting. I know, okay, so from the influenza virus, they have, I think, like the top 200 strains in the vaccine. They don't have all the strains? The top, top three? three? Yeah, so there's, a, there's an effort, a statistical analysis every single year, that predicts what the top three likely flu variants will be. This is why you get something like the flu vir- the flu vaccine didn't work this year or something like that. Yes, yes, yes. And I mean, by and large, they're most they're they're predominantly effective. But sometimes the you know predominant variant of flu of influenza that year is not one of those three. So there's a flu outbreak. So how many are there out there? A flu variants. Yeah, at oh, any given time, it, it man, I have hundreds, no thousands. No, not. I mean, so I am not an influenza expert. Okay. The variants Fair. are named by you've heard of probably like H one N one. Yeah. So that's hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. Those are the two proteins that the virus, the two enzymes that use. I think it's hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. I know it's neuraminidase. It's one of it's one of two proteins, two proteins that the virus uses to gain entry and exit into the cell. If it gains ent- entry into the cell, it's most likely going to kill it. Vi- the flu virus is really cool. Not for that reason. So variants of those proteins, and there are seven, so H1, H5, H2, H3, N1, N2, N5. So if you think of like seven different things being able to recombine, and it's called a segmented genome, so you can stick one segment on another. So that's why the, the variants always switch in that. That's why they, there's, there are other ways they're genetically distinct, but those are the predominant ones. I'm rambling. I totally forgot your question. <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, it, it, it's okay. I, I, I stopped listening about that's a minute ago. Yeah, and that's good. Now I'll, t- I'll tell you why. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the same man who, before the call, got a second phone call and just started speaking German fluently. He thinks he can't speak it. I can barely speak English and not well in one language. And this motherfucker rambles science, scientific words. I didn't even stop you. I didn't know so many of the words. So to be fair, can, it's exactly the same thing when you were discussing Roe v. Wade and you took the time to explain what each one of those terms meant. So you did a much better job of it. I'm just kind of going rapid fire. Yeah, but I can't speak Spanish and I grew up in East L.A. So my point being is this is an A brain. So you're like and a this is a C pl- <laughs> Pretty much <laughs> when it comes to. No, you know what? I think I'm just linguistically retarded. I don't, I, I don't speak. My grammar is horrible. But that's a whole different discussion. My point is, I'm an idiot. He's smart, hmm. but at least I can at least I can stuff takedowns. So I'll take it and let's move on from here. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's true. I okay. Will, yeah. Anyway. All right. Where do we go here? Okay. So. So in terms of if you should take the booster, yes, you should take the booster. In my opinion. Yes. So in my opinion, your colleague, you know what? I wouldn't speak to your colleague. So I recently had a bout of COVID. I got it okay. here on a, I got it from pretty sure it was my mom and we oh, were on geez. a cruise ship and then we were on a train and then several, oh, several buses. I mean, if you wanted to get an infectious <laughs> just, disease, it's fucking, it's yeah. You might as well climb in an incubator with a sick person, which is essentially what we did. So my mom had COVID. I have COVID. My husband has COVID. So did all the other passengers. Uh, yeah, right. Now my daughter just tested positive for COVID. Oh, um, I'm sorry. At, 
I mean, yeah, I am too. We're extremely fortunate. We're all healthy. We've been boosted, Good. which you know does blunt the uh, virulence or the impact that the the virus can have on your body. So yes, I will continue to get the booster when it is offered to me. I'm bummed that I didn't get the booster that I wasn't uh, ineligible for the booster before we went. Obviously, my daughter is vaccinated and boosted, and so is my all of my family is vaccinated and boosted because the next booster and the subsequent boosters will be intelligently designed, put through reams of statistical analysis to predict which epitopes of the virus on several proteins, most likely the spike protein, because that kind of gets the most mention, will be likely to be exhibited by the virus so that it gains entry into your cells. If your immune system is primed to recognize those new, we'll call them epitopes, then you have that much more of an effective immune response versus the traditional, like the, the way that our bodies are designed to work, which is you get infected and then your body develops the response right. to it. It's, it's sort of the, this is not entirely, this is not entirely uh, accurate, but generals fight the last war. Hmm. So right. if, if your enemy attacks you with something different, then you're caught with your pants down. But if it's similar enough, then you can mount an effective response. So yes, I would get the booster I plan to. Is it fair to say that the coronavirus boosters are now essentially the annual flu shots? Yeah, the I same model. It. So yeah, so I mean, I'm sure forests have been emptied with the amount of paper that have gone into printing studies for coronavirus so over the past two and a half, three years. As long as you had co- coronavirus or COVID in your paper's title, you could pretty much plan on it getting published. And there's, you know, science is a very two steps forward, one step back, three steps forward, two steps back. You move along by inches in understanding. But in my experience, one of the papers I read very early on was it suggested that this would become an endemic disease, similar to flu, similar to measles, similar to a common cold, maybe not as benign as the cold. But based on the way it replicated, the speed at which it replicated and the speed at which it evolved and variants cropped up and, and this is not nothing, the interconnected global society we now enjoy. That's kind of what I it made a lot of sense to me at the time. Yep. Absolutely. And for all intents and purposes, you might as well expect, in my opinion, I expect it to become an endemic thing that we treat on a biannual, annual basis. If I'm wrong, I'd love to be wrong. Great. How, but how can we be sure that this is not a push by the pharmaceutical industry just to make money on the vaccine? I work for a pharmaceutical company that helps make one of those vaccines. See? So I and you're a corrupt person. I <clears throat> that's not true. <laughs> um, I'm, I am a very boring cog in a wheel at the, and I'm, it's not even a, like a big wheel. It's a very small wheel, and I'm a very small cog. Um, so and I'm not what, even that good at my job. So oh, I I doubt that's true. But so when I make statements like that, everybody needs to know that part of me believes it. And part of me knows it, it, how silly it sounds. So I'm, I'm kind of conflicted. I got the one booster and then I tapped. I said, nope, no, thank you. I, just because the CDC and Fauci goddamn crypt keeper just pissed me off. And so I, I know that's a stupid reason that it could come back and bite me in the butt. Hopefully it will not. But it felt good. Thumbing my nose and rejecting their vaccines and, you know, I guess the question is, is do I want to deal with a cold or a flu every year? Well, I take the, the flu shot every year and I know it's a new science, but it sounds like it's similar science enough, just new methodology. So I'm going to debate on this one, whether I should, I mean, if I punch my ticket, I'd finally get some peace and quiet. So that's a, a reason not to. But well, this is not to dissuade you from your opinion. So the two things okay. I always come to when it comes to vaccines are, I've never had this conversation with someone. I, I don't often, as you may imagine, I don't I don't hang out with anti-vaxxers. And even if I did, most people are, are reluctant to adopt new information. All of us. It's a human tendency. It's a human cycle. By the way, I, I am not anti-vaxxer. No, you're not. And I'm not suggesting I'll, you are. Yeah, yeah. No, oh, no, I know, I know you weren't. But my, just so everybody knows, my position is, I think we push it a little too much and too quick. Maybe let the baby get two two months before you stick him with seven needles and pump all this horrific shit in them. But that's that's the extent I would go to is like, hey, let's just let let's let their body mature for a couple months. I think in the UK, 
you don't get your vaccination shots till six months. No idea. Four months, the baby. So my point is we don't have to give them the first day. That's as far as I go. Sorry. Uh, My point is that we told those guys about a little over 250 years ago, you can fucking take your tea and crumpets. We're going to do it (laughs) our way. So fair enough. As I'm drinking my Earl Grey. Nice. (laughs) Nice. Okay. So you were saying, so when it comes to vaccine, you do not know anyone who has ever had smallpox. I do not know anyone who's ever had smallpox. It is exceptionally unlikely that we will meet someone who's had smallpox in our life. True. I do not know anyone who has ever had measles. I don't know anyone who, I know someone who's had chicken pox, me. Me. I don't know anyone who's had chicken pox anytime recently. My mom has True. shingles and that's pretty common in older people. Yeah. that's different. Um, and I can go on down the list of vaccinated diseases of whom I personally have, you know, either personally have no experience or have never met anyone with personal experience of that. If we turn the clock back a hundred years, sure, yeah, or 150 years, we can no longer enjoy the confidence of those statements. So, smallpox, for instance, has I think a 30 percent fatality rate with variola. Mine, there are two major vi- oh um, two major variants. Uh, that's nothing. There are two major major variants of smallpox. One is called variola minor. The other is called variola major. I think variola minor has like a 10 to a 30 percent. That's a huge shift. I know um, fatality rate. Variola major has a 95 percent fatality rate. Jesus. Yeah. I mean, you shed your epithelia. People are literally shitting out the own lining of their intestines. It's massive internal bleeding. It's horrible. And it tra- and it's it's transmitted by oh, infected. I thought Ebola was bad. Yeah, and Ebola is is horrible too. That has a sixty five percent fatality rate, and upwards, if you get like Zaire Ebola virus, it could be upwards of ninety. Oh my god, plague is fucking horrible. So like the Black Death, like it's you know it's in the cultural understanding. Mm-hmm. But there are three variants of plague: bubonic, which everybody recognize a septicemic and pneumonic. Sure. Bubonic is bad. You get that through the bites of fleas. I think that's around 40 to 60% right. fatality rate. And it's exceptionally painful. It lasts like two, three weeks. Septicemic plague takes about two, three days. That's a gut infection with Yersinia pestis, the bacteria that causes it. Pneumonic plague can take inside of a day. Oh my God. You could breathe in pneumonic plague. You check in out. In the morning. <laughs> Later that and night. And be dead by that afternoon. Fucking A. What's the percentage? A hundred. Like flat 100, yeah, 100. 100. I, that is fucking insane. Not trying to give anybody ideas, but I mean, when they develop biological warfare, you just stuff some of that shit in a smart bomb and send it over. You think, right? But it's a bacterium and there are lots of drugs against the bacteria. Now, granted, plague still happens. Like Madagascar experienced a, a bout of plague like in the past decade. And it, they, it's a recurrent thing. No one fucking wants plague. It's awful. I'm sure. I've, I hope I'll never have it. <laughs> like even the Chinese or Russians are like, that's yeah, going a bit far. <laughs> like, well, you know, that's, I mean, we're still all human people. <laughs> anyway, so plague not with Sandy because that's not a virus. We will never experience those things. God forbid. Smallpox does exist in the world. It does not exist in the natural world. It's been effect- It's been effectively eradicated. It exists in laboratories now under heavy guard. So the fact that we've invented a technology that relieves humanity of those burdens. If, if there were no other reason, convinces me that vaccination is a good thing. Now, there's lots of science behind sure. the new stuff. Sure. And I forget what my second reason was. Now, as far as the safety of vaccines, that you can, I mean, it's standard. It's standard accepted. Now, you can debate the, the course, I guess, of vaccine administration. It's fairly standard. It's fairly well researched and documented and effective the way it is. It's based on a lot of different things. But there's. We as a society would not have the luxury of debating vaccines sure. if we enjoyed this, the lack of their benefit, yep. like people 150 years ago. You offer, I mean, if you offered me as a parent a protective medication that. Let's say smallpox still existed and I had the opportunity to protect my so- my child, even though there was like a 1% chance they'd be infected in the next two years. Absolutely. 100%. Right. right. Because what is the, what, what's the alternative? Yeah, I could go on a rant about how I've had conversations with people about not wanting to take medicine or go to the hospital. And I, I said, live in that world. You wouldn't even meet. One of us wouldn't be here. 
So we're almost, well, we ran over our target oh, market. Yeah, let, sorry. I'm so sorry. No, I'm, no, no, no. I'm sorry. This is great. Let me ask you one follow up question and then we'll head on over to the B side. So, my wife's question Should I get the kids a booster or is one good enough? I cannot advise your wife or your family. I will, I will tell you that I will get my daughter a booster. Okay. She currently has COVID. I will still get her a booster for the same reasons that I would, t- that I will take a booster in the future that I believe your colleague would be, be- would be served better by having a booster shot administrated. Any papers, you know, of that give percentages. And in other words, if you had COVID, you have 40 to 60% immunity, you get this extra booster that can up it by 20%. Yeah. So when you say 40 to 60% immunity, that's one of those things. It, it's, it kind of gets lost in its translation that 40 to 60% immunity is, and I can't explain it very well either. So that sucks. It's, it's reported that way because it's reported to the FDA that way when they talk, when it, and it goes through this boatload of statistical uh, analysis and it gets just crunched through this giant machine of math to arrive at in X number of cases, there is X uh, protective effect for, you know, X people. It sounds like 10 people that take the vaccine, only six of them will enjoy the prophylactic effect. Correct. That's not the case. It's not that Moderna, nine, 9.5 people enjoy the protective effect. Or in that point, in that point five per, I'll say one person out of 20 gets, you know, fucked. Sure. That's not the case. It's just sounds like that based on like if, you know, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine only is like 60% effective. Right, 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 right. It was like, oh, you got Johnson and Johnson. Oh, enjoy the fucking respirator. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't work out that way. It's just, it's, it sounds a lot like that. And it's, it's a bad way to report it. Uh, and there's more, mul- and there's multiple reasons of why it's not as effective. And I'm sure we could go into why various ones kind of like people don't take the medicine properly. Don't, don't get the follow-up shops and all that. Yeah. There's a really good paper that I, you know, I can, I, you know, I, I, I could look it up right now because I saved the paper. I'm not going to do that. There's a really good report that I think was put out in Nature probably two months ago that discuss. It's kind of the paper that you that a physician would want. It discusses the four major types of vaccines that exist for COVID and their effectiveness in certain in the populations of vaccinated individuals got it over an 18 month period and that pretty much explains like and and therefore like the mrna vaccine an attenuated strain people that have had covid before and uh, the other type of vaccine that i can't remember off the top of my head it's great paper but I'm, of course that's all i can say about it it's like if you look up if you google scholar nature vaccine efficacy you'll get four thousand papers easily that's awesome but it was a recent nature publication and it's like four types of vaccine efficacy or something like that. Well, thank you for running through this. Thank you for answering my questions and, you know, at least entertaining my moronic ramblings and opinions of this matter I know nothing about. Everyone out there, just be safe, be healthy. Don't personally care where you come down on it. My only true opinion is that COVID was a failure. It has substantially let me down. Traffic is bad again. And you, you scientists, you smart people. Get the fuck to work, not on vaccines, but on a virus that kills stupid and bad people. That's all I want. Uh, COVID's a pretty good one at that. It, <laughs> not decision-making stupid. I mean, just oh. like morally stupid, IQ stupid, you know, people who... Oh, the other thing is, and I apologize, I know we're over time. So the first thing is we've never enjoyed... You and I, our society has never experienced what a true outbreak would be of an awfully of a virus that's far worse than COVID ever was. And granted the fatality rate was 2% at its highest and that's awful. And a lot of people died, but I mean, something like 1918 Spanish influenza, that's, that's fucking atrocious. That's 50 million people. Right. Right. The other thing is when it comes to self global warming, when it comes to, well, so did world war one, which happened right before <laughs> it. when it comes to, vaccination against an infectious agent it is absolutely my choice to protect myself or not protect myself from that agent unfortunately i may also be relieving another person of their choice to protect themselves because of course it's commu- it's communicable true true yeah All right, i'll shut up true so again you know where he stands i i believe in free choice and i should be forced to do this or lose their job after it but those are political opinions and subjective and I'm not going to say who's right or wrong. I just know it's right for me and those five two wizard. All right. Thank you for hanging. Thank you. Sorry for cutting you off. Thank you for hanging with us. Uh, we will now get on to the B-side. That's it. That's our show. 
Told you we were going to have an actual intelligent conversation for once. <sighs> Too bad that conversation was one-sided. Join us next time for episode 6, the B-Side, where we discuss our favorite sequel to a video game series. Please do us the favor and like, subscribe, and share this podcast so we can get some traction. Once I get around to it, check us out on our socials. Combative Nerds on Patreon, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. You know the deal. Thanks for hanging out. We'll see you next episode.